Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Tonight, I want to talk about Giorgio Di Maria's The 20 Days of Turin. This is my first ever video that I'm shooting at night. Normally I do these in the middle of the day or in the earlier morning. Um, but I feel like it is appropriate for this book because it is in that vein of uh, more horror and thriller and takes the form of a ghost story. It reminded me of Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft and uh, Henry James's The Turn of the Screw, which is a really important book to me. But let's take a moment to look at that cover art one more time. This is the absolute best cover art they could have put on here. It's adapted by a piece of art uh, by Felicien Roque called C'est un seulement livré uh, from 1906 and if you study this, this is an uh, enormous uh, apparition uh, walking over top of Paris and even though this takes place in Turin and not Paris, look at it for a little while before you even start reading the book just to just to take in everything that's going on here in this uh, this haunting imagery because it actually does uh, enhance the story. For all that, however, um, I've seen that a lot of people, um, if you approach this as a like strictly horror genre, um, you know, as a piece by Stephen King or Thomas Ligotti or Richard Lehman, Jack Ketchum, if you approach it like that um, as like someone who's looking for straight horror, uh, I think you may be uh, disappointed because normally with these types of books we're going in for that that chill that just just for that pure chill you know it's the, the reason we watch horror movies and so on and that will cheapen it there's a lot more going on in here this is a very literary work even though it is considered a cult novel it came out in 1977 um, and has you know had a following and this is its uh, English debut uh, it's translated by Ramon Glassoff, whom I've never heard of, haven't read any of uh, the translations there, but this, uh, this book was recommended to me by a subscriber. I think it was on my 10 favorite short books or 10 short books that I love video, um, but that subscriber also has a channel, um, and more importantly now, uh, a very vibrant and informative blog and Twitter feed and her name is Beyond the Epilogue. I'll put links to her uh, channel and blog and Twitter down below. Uh, so thank you so much Beyond the Epilogue because I thoroughly enjoyed this. It's actually a very short read. It is a novel. Um, the length of this hardcover is a little deceptive because uh, the novel or novella is 144 pages and it's very, so it's very short and it's actually a very quick read. Um, it has this really nice 18 page translator's introduction which gives a lot of the historical context um, that is important for unlocking some of the depths and where uh, these ideas came from for De Maria. Um, but then it's padded uh, at the end with a short story and then an essay uh, from the author. There's a deep history around uh, Italy and the, the mystery genre. Um, I'm thinking about the Giallo films that Dario Argento made famous and, and uh, I heard one person describe it as their slashers but classier. Um, and you know, you think of Umberto Eco and the the mystery oh you know um though this you know this book lacks the erudition of an umberto eco novel but it, it carries on that tradition that we see in italy um with this this love for for the mystery genre and the crime the inexplicable crime genre you know uh, giallo means yellow and that was coined from the fact that as these pulp books were coming out they always had these lurid yellow covers so they were referred to as giallos um, you know and they're really um, 
there are really more uh, connections with like a Lovecraft story or a Poe story. Um, and one way that I thought about it uh, is that it's like H.P. Lovecraft or Edgar Allan Poe, but using that American minimalism that Gordon Lish really pushed in the 80s and 90s in America. The atmosphere is very Italian. Um, it's imbued with tense spiritualism of Italy coming out of the Roman Catholic Church. There are basilicas and monuments of saints. Um, you know, filling the pages of the work and the monuments are very important, by the way. Um, but there's that underlying pulse of supernatural uh, inclinations in the air. The plot, in a nutshell, is that the narrator, who is unnamed, um, and, you know, this is sort of like Murakami novels where um, it's in the first person and that first person narrator remains unnamed. Um, and this actually does, uh, that always works well uh, for pulling the reader into the story a little better because with an unnamed narrator in the first person, and especially in the first person present tense, it makes us, um, as the readers, it makes us feel like it's happening to us. Um, instead of to someone else who's been telling us about it. De Maria, he also, he attacks all the senses with this thing. Um, he attacks smell and touch and sound and sight. Um, and anyhow, it's this narrator who's sort of a journalist um, who he's grown up in Turin and there was this uh, time, this period of uh, mass hysteria where um, there was insomnia that was gripping the town and there was this really strange group of people that created this establishment or this network, we should say, um, called the library. Um, and then these um, brutal crimes that were occurring um, that began to, to point to supernatural elements, but it gripped the town. Um, and as the translator points out in the uh, introduction, the historical precedent for this um, was that this came uh, in the 60s um, in which the, the author de Maria grew up. There was a like daily police harassment um, and terrorism and go on, just civil unrest um, and a lot of that paranoia and living through that finds its place in here um, as this period of mass hysteria or mass insomnia um, and these strange happenings that go on for 20 days and it's now you know in here it's now uh, mythologized as the 20 days of Turin. He's trying to go around after the fact and interview people who were involved starting with uh, as we open up um, the uh, person who was killed um, by one of these uh, perhaps supernatural uh, entities. Um, he's interviewing that person's sister, trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and in, in true mystery genre style, we open up with sort of this interrogation between the narrator and this one character, and then it just leads, you know, one clue leads to another, um, and we just keep meeting a series of people. While at the same time, you know, the insomnia and then the vinegar smell that they talk about. And, and when he mentions the library, um, that victim's sister like blushes and, and won't talk about it. And so, um, you know, and then the, they, they start referring to this as this, this object, this entity as the horrible thing. And so, you know, each little um, gem or breadcrumb that the author lays out there is so well placed and the pacing is perfect to just constantly ratchet up tension um, and help us to feel that that sense of unease and that paranoia uh, it's the, it's you know the narrator is the classic everyman you know he is approaching things in the face of everybody's um, spiritualism and so on um, and the fact that Turin is steeped in the occult um, even to this day, you know, this is the place where in real life they have the, the famous Shroud of Turin, which is that piece of linen they believed um, that Christ's body was wrapped in. And there's uh, a figure of what appears to look like a man, possibly Jesus, imprinted on that shroud. You know, so there are all these little things like that historically in real life um, that lend Turin this, uh, this, supernatural mystique 
And so taking that into the book as well and knowing that that's a very real element uh, heightens that atmosphere. Uh, but you've got this narrator who's steeping us in the everyman, again, unnamed to make it feel like it's us. Uh, and then also, you know, he's using reason. He's, he's going into this um, trying to rationally explain everything, uh, which of course uh, falls apart uh, the more he does it. Um, as things, you know, as uh, he himself starts to feel that he's being followed and watched and, um, you know, people are getting uneasy about his investigation and so on, he puts things that you will begin thinking as a reader, he goes ahead and puts them out there. Like, he goes ahead and talks about um, maybe he has a split personality and stuff like that. And that's always a very effective way um, of, of stringing us along because he, he can quickly close off uh, anything that our mind is starting to shape. So then we're, we're even more interested, well, okay, it's not that, what's, what's happening next? The library um, is the framework that structures this whole underground world um, that led up to and, and continued to um, thrive during the 20 days of Turin. The library is a group of people that got together um, and started preying on people's insecurities and so on. And they would not publish or would not collect traditionally printed books. They would only collect amateur diaries and, you know, just rantings and um, strange taboo writings and so on. They, they, they said that they only wanted authentic literature, stuff that came from, from truly from a person. Because they said that traditional, you know, fiction, traditional literature is all artifice and they wanted to erase all that. But furthermore, they wanted to connect people together. So the translator talks about how um, De Maria actually, in a way, um, you know, foretold and foresaw uh, social media and social networking as we see it today because um, they, the library, these people went under the guise of connecting uh, people together through their own stories and you could actually um, pay a fee to actually follow that person and know who they were and go and actually talk to them, connect with them and vice versa or you could try to stay anonymous but we find that um, even though the place, you know, was reduced to an ash heap, we see that even um, in the narrator's day that he's trying to investigate everything, people are dropping things in dumpsters and then someone else is coming and, you know, getting it out. And, uh, the narrator himself actually does this at one point and finds that it is indeed these personal writings. So this, n this network that has uh, been created out of this still persists. And so, you know, he and as well as a, a French psychologist in here try to explain it away by saying that the mass insomnia is because people are getting more and more aware that they're being followed and that people are having uh, a way of looking into their personal lives that they put out there um, and it's causing this paranoia and they're, you know, confessing things in these diaries and so on that, you know, they're ashamed of and that uh, is now making them hyper aware that um, people are having these views of them that are putting them at risk and so on. And then, of course, the violence begins. Um, and this violence is such that um, it cannot be explained uh, as a result of human beings. And then we begin to learn um, a lot of peculiar things about monuments and the, you know, the statues in the place. Um, and in fact, uh, it does not seem that I can get away from Robert Musel, uh, the man without qualities that I just finished up and did a handful of videos uh, about because his posthumous papers of a living author, it comes into play here. Um, and he talks about some peculiarities, uh, some peculiar properties with monuments that tie into what's going on in the 20 days of Turin. Um, and it's almost as if we're getting these, these intimations that the monuments themselves are coming to life and battling each other and using uh, these uh, insomniacs as weapons in some cases and, and fighting over their pedestals. And in fact, this plays out in a play that the narrator attends outside of Turin on his way uh, to Venice to escape all of this madness because he finally um, is ready to, to give up.
in that play, it's actually mythologized to the point where uh, this is in fact what's happening. Uh, the monuments are, are fighting for each other's pedestals. That, you know, we're just playthings. The human beings are just playthings. I like this. Um, at one point, um, the narrator visits uh, Guifrida, and he you know, is a sort of a reclusive figure who apparently has recordings that he captured during the 20 days of Turin um, with the the sounds and voices of perhaps the apparitions or or some of the people. Um, it's a really interesting uh, transformation that takes place. Um, but he says, I lean more towards Hans Bender's hypothesis that what we call apparitions aren't ghosts, but the unconscious mind venting itself. Which really, it's, I love it when authors in, in stories like these, when these strange, weird events are taking place, and you know, we're being led to try and figure out what's going on, that they throw something out there like that. Now, earlier I said that it's like Lovecraft or Poe, but written in that 80s, 90s, uh, Gordon Lishian American minimalism, but that doesn't detract from the fact that the writing is still um, extremely good. Um, it's a it's a master class in descriptive writing, honestly. Um, and so I'll just read an excerpt. Right then, a sullen gurgle appeared without warning, a low agitation in gluggy waters coming from a whirlpool. It began as a modest sucking noise, then, little by little, it spiraled into a ravenous, far-reaching withdrawal, as if hundreds of mouths were dipping into a monstrous water hole, determined to tap it dry, as if a thousand-year-old thirst had finally found a wellspring where it could drink its fill. I was grabbed by a sickness that came from nowhere. It felt like those parched lips were inside me, siphoning away my lymph to slake their need. The malaise passed as quickly as it came, but now I too couldn't avoid clogging up my ears with my thumbs. And so you can see that, you know, the, this descriptive writing is, um, it, there were several moments uh, that I won't read, I'll save them for you, but there were several moments that literally did give me chills. Um, and it was more than just the fact that I'm currently living, like all of you, in a time right now uh, of somewhat paranoia. Not to this level, but, you know, um, social distancing and quarantining, um, you know, at the hands of this coronavirus. Um, and in fact, this was my first read uh, during the social distancing phase and so on. Um, but it was more than just that. And I read this at night. I highly recommend... Um, you know, making sure that it's nighttime and that maybe you just have a candle lit or just one lamp on that is, you know, predominantly dark uh, in your house or wherever you're reading it and that you lock in when you can read it, you know. Um, it's really, you can read it in one sitting uh, fairly easily. Um, and just like Poe in his uh, Poetic Principle essay, he talked about how uh, the most effective stories, the most effective poems um, should be read, made to read in one setting. And he, he's talking, in a, when he means effective, he means like, uh, like a ghost story or something that's really going to stir the emotions. Um, and that's what we get here. But the, the writing is such that it really opens up all the senses and pulls you into what's going on. Um, at a level to where you do get unnerved. It's more than just a story. It's a clever, clever ending, um, but I will put my own sort of theory out there. It says that, um, it, and this is the very, very end, and, and I don't think it'll spoil anything, but it says, out of instinct, I put my recorder against my lips, and for what, this is actually the musical instrument recorder, against my lips, and for what little I knew, I began to play it. From the depths of blackest despair, perhaps I'd managed to dig out a sound capable of soothing these powers. I was clutching at my last straw. And so uh, there's been a lot of confusion from what I've read about what maybe what the author was trying to get at. And I'll just throw mine out there. Um, even though it's a recorder and not a flute, um, technically, you know, earlier on page 58, the narrator has gone home and he has put on the uh, Mozart's Flute Concerto Number no. 1 in G major uh, and he started reading the um, 
the posthumous papers of a living author by Robert Musel and got to his section on monuments. And so all these things kind of stirred together. And I noticed that on, on page 58, when he does that, <coughs> it says, uh, you know, he, he listened to Mozart's Flute Concerto Number no. 1 in G Major on his record player. And then it says, before a burst of memory gave me a sudden solution. Um, and all it says, uh, it doesn't tell us what this solution necessarily is or, um, you know, solution to what necessarily um, and so on. But then, you know, he goes and, and it makes him think of um, going and finding that book. And he finds the book, the Musel book, under his mattress. And he says, why exactly had I stuck it there? He's very perplexed, like, why is it there? And then the next sentence he said, he says, did objects have a mind of their own? And this starts to point to, you know, the monuments. Um, and the very first thing he reads about monuments in Musel is, of all the peculiarities that monuments can claim, one feature stands out for sheer irony. The strangest thing about monuments is they're not at all noticeable. And so all these pointers, um, and then remember the, the flute concerto number one before a burst of memory gave him the solution. It made me think of um, Die Zoberflöte, or the magic uh, flute by Mozart, also by Mozart. And in that play, um, Tamino's flute is magical and it can turn sorrow into joy and it is used um, to help him uh, and others around him get through um, certain villainous obstacles. So I think there may be a connection there. You know, he's he obviously likes to listen to classical music, he, and especially Mozart uh, specifically. Even though you know this could be an oblique connection because it's not explicitly referenced, but. Um, you know, given that he listens to Mozart and he's got this recorder um, and he's in uh, a perilous circumstance and he just said, like he says, out of instinct, he put his recorder to his lips and hoped that he'd managed to dig out a sound capable of soothing these powers. One thing is certain, I will be reading this again very soon, um, not only because it's uh, short and quick um, and uh, highly enjoyable, but I do think there are a lot of little things that uh, Giorgio De Maria um, strung out there and peppered this story with that I didn't quite latch on to. Um, it's, it's deceptive in that while it is a quick and highly emotionally effective read, um, there are also layers to it um, that, are, that you almost don't notice until it's over. And if you need any further convincing, why not just read the copy on the back, which says, Written at the height of the domestic terror in 1970s Italy, a cult novel with distinct echoes of Lovecraft and Borges makes its English language debut. I highly recommend The 20 Days of Turin by Giorgio de Maria.